Okay, um, so uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Luther O'Brook um, from University of Pennsylvania, uh, and his topic is Form as uh, Polemic uh, Intellectual Debates um, and the Legacy of Kavya Dasha in South India. myself, so I just never know if I'm being <laughs> amplified or not. Um, <coughs> okay, um, so, uh, so I'm going to be presenting something that's a bit inchoate, even in my, uh, in, in my own thinking about this. So I'm just beginning to undertake this project, even though I've been reading this text for several years now. Um, and I've been really thinking about how to think about this text. And actually this, um, this conference has this workshop, this conference, whatever you want to say, has been really, really useful for me. Uh, many themes keep on coming up. And I, before I start, I just want to highlight a few things that hopefully I'll return to at the end. We've been talking a lot about diffusion. We've been talking about translation. We've been talking about commentary. And patronage, I think, is always kind of in the background of these things. And these provide different lenses through which we can begin to talk about this, especially when we start seeing how um, we stop seeing texts just as texts but instead start seeing uh, authors and agents using text in specific ways to situate themselves and to make specific claims about the past and their own place uh, in the present. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be pushing towards here, even though I have nothing uh, concrete uh, um, to say, uh, no Siddhanta that I'm going to come to at the end. Um, so. So what I'm going to be looking at is Literature in Another Mirror, the Kavya Darpana, and the History of Poetics in Early Modern South Asia. Um, I use Early Modern here, uh, by the way, just as an aside, I use Early Modern here. Uh, I should put like asterisks and um, um, quotation marks around it. Periodicization is always a difficult topic, but it's something we can talk about, which I think would be interesting to talk about how we, can we talk about different movements of how texts are used, how people write, this sort of thing. Can we talk about an early modern moment? That's something I'm also interested in, but an aside. Um, <clears throat> so uh, today I'm going to introduce another mirror. Uh, this is the Kavya Darpana. Darpana is another Sanskrit word for mirror. So we could even call this a Kavya Darsha, Kavya Darpana. They mean the same thing. Um, but does that actually mean anything? We'll get to that uh, a little bit later on. Just in a nutshell, uh, the Kavya Darpana um, the Kavya Darpana is a complex text. Um, so I have my cast of characters here that I will be talking about that range from Dundon through Mamrta to Apaya Dikshita and then our author, Raja Chudamani Dikshita, uh, who worked at the uh, court of Raghunath Nayaka, who reigned from 1614 to 1634. Uh, and because I can't have a slideshow without a picture, here, here he is. Um, so uh, what's interesting about this work is that it is a rewriting of Mamata's Kavya Prakasha that attempts to provide Mamata as a Siddhanta, which is a very strange thing to do. Instead of writing a commentary, he rewrites the text, karakas and all. Um, so uh, Larry mentioned this text briefly in his own uh, uh, presentation, but here, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Kashmiri poetic theory, this, is, this becomes the kind of essential piece of, of Kashmiri Alankara Shastra that gets exported. This becomes the touchstone. And it's, uh, in, in many ways, a synthesis that tries to do two things at once. It tries to provide the linguistic theoretical background that is so important to the Kashmiri theorists, 
and also provide a definitive tropology, so it does all the figures of speech. So the first chapters are about the linguistic theory side of things, and the, the latter chapters uh, do the figures of speech. Okay, um, sorry, I'm still introducing this. Uh, <laughs> as another <laughs> way of introduction, I should talk about, about this text, how, where I found this text. Um, I was kind of um, kicking around Pondicherry and um, looking for something to read. I would read anything with anyone. I was just trying to get my Sanskrit um, better. And Anjaneya Sharma suggested that we read this text together. Um, and also Francois Grimal, who is there, is also in very interested in this text. And he introduced it to me by saying, this text is terrible, terrible, sir, terribly beautiful. And uh, it's been a text that I've been bashing my head against for several years. Uh, it, is, it is terrible in many ways, but it is beautiful in some other ways. So. Um, uh, that's where we are. So anyway, um, uh, let me go back to the dramatis personae, uh, as, as it were. Uh, Rajachudamani Dikshita uh, composed the Kavya Dharpana in the court of Raghunatha Nayaka of Tanjore. <laughs> Raghunatha Nayaka is remembered as a great patron of the arts um, and has been eulogized in a number of works in both Sanskrit and Telugu. Uh, for instance, there's uh, the Raghunatha Abhiyudaya, which is written by uh, uh, the courtesan, uh, I'm forgetting her name now. Anyway, uh, they, um, uh, oh, I have it here. Ramabhadrambha and uh, the Raghunatha Vilasa by Yajna Narayana Dikshita. Um, and both of these, you know, it shows this king in this very kind of eroticized model of kingship. So he was a guy that liked to have people write about himself in very high sort of uh, Sanskrit. Um, uh, uh, Valteru Narayan Rao, David Shulman, and Sanjay Subramaniam have talked about the intersection of poetry and rule in their study of the Nayaka's uh, Symbols of Substance, which is a great work on this sort of thing. Now, uh, in one level, the Kavya Dharpana is very much in this vein. Um, almost all of the examples, when they're not just kind of about unnamed heroes and heroines, either deal with the Rama story directly or with Raghunatha Nayaka. There, you don't get, actually, you get one or two verses that say Shiva, but el almost everything else is. Um, is either Rama, Rama story, or, and of course, Raghunatha and Rama, these, these things go together. Um, here I hope to add to this conversation um, a little bit, well, I, I don't know if I'll talk about how Raghunatha appears in the Kavya, uh, Kavya Darpana, but he does appear in somewhat surprising ways as, as illustrations for such things as Jahel Lakshana and things like that. Um, now, Rajachidami Dikshita's Kavya Darpana uh, reimagines the 11th century Kavya, Kavya Prakasha. The Kavya Dharpana both uh, presents Mamata as the ideal model for understanding aesthetic theory while tacitly arguing that it needed to be rewritten and rephrased in a new intellectual context. So this is, I think, this interesting tension between presenting some set of ideas as Siddhanta and needing to rewrite it. In writing the Kavya Dharpana, Rajachanamdi acts in two ways. Firstly, he looks to the past to provide a definitive theorization of poetry. And secondly, he intends to give that understanding a new sort of articulation. And that new articulation is often um, very polemical with, with what he sees as his context, where people are getting it wrong. <clears throat> now, um, also I should say, um, this, this, what I'm talking about here, I don't intend to present this in any sort of systematic or um, broad sort of way. I've been working on this text for many years, as I've said, but I've, uh, while doing it, I've been making an addition and translation. So I just brought, here's the first chapter with my notes and translation. Um, the second chapter, which we'll be talking about a bit more, is about six times that large. It's a gigantic text. Um, and I haven't, <laughs> I haven't read the whole thing because it hasn't even been published, the entirety of the text. There is a, tel a Telugu Lippi edition of the text, but it doesn't include the last two chapters. Then there's a uh, uh, Devanagari edition of the text that's only four, the first four chapters. So there's not, oh yeah, sorry, first six chapters, yeah. Um, uh, so here today, I hope to offer several contextualizations which can help us both imagine a place for the Kavya Dharpana in the literary ecology of second millennium Sanskrit and concomitantly help us think through the complex terrain that Sanskrit intellectuals navigated in the 17th century. At the end, I return to this, uh, to this idea of, of kind of translation and, and uh, kind of encoding history, especially uh, in, in regards to Dundon um, and Apayadikshita, uh, but 
this is uh, where I'm going here. Um, the Kavya Dharpana has received relatively little scholarly attention. Um, it's been, you know, referred to in different works, but it hasn't really been studied. It was part of the uh, some syllabuses for Sanskrit learning in Andhra um, in the early 20th century, but that has kind of dropped out now. Um, the text. Um, the text consists of shloka-style um, definitions and examples, followed by an auto-commentary written in what we might call Navyanyaya style, so uh, inf inflected by this dense idiom of uh, Shastric Sanskrit. Uh, this idiom is the pan-South Asian register, a philosophical inquiry across South Asia in the second millennium. Um, Raja Chudamani also directly confronts several of his contemporaries, especially Upaya Dikshita, and this will become important later on. I mean, actually, the second chapter is basically an ad hominem attack against Apaya Dikshita that goes on for, um, in, in, when I wrote it, uh, when I worked this out with uh, Francois Grimal and uh, Anjanea Sharma, we came up with about, I think it was 230 pages of ad hominem attack against uh, Apaya Dikshita. So it's quite remarkable. Um, so, um, you know, he's one of these, perhaps we can talk about since, uh, Different people are in the room, uh, one of these new intellectuals, perhaps, and someone who's uh, right at this verge of this, uh, uh, an interesting moment, um, and writing in, in, in an interesting way. We have a large number of Raja Chudamani's works, although they have not been systematically studied. Um, he writes, uh, my favorite of his works is he writes this thing called the Shankara Abhyudaya, which basically shows Shankara going around and beating all of his opponents. Um, and Shankara stops through Raja Chudamani's hometown of Kanchi and is like, oh, wow, this, this Kanchi, yeah, this place is good. I like this place. And then at that point, Raja Chudamani sticks in his own CV of all the things that will be written there <laughs> later in the future. <laughs> like, this city is so great because all of these things will be written here in the future. And it's basically all the things that uh, Raja Chudamani, or someone from here will write all these works. And he, he lists his CV. It's, it's quite phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as the basis for an intellectual history, the positioning of the Kavya Dharpana points towards some interesting possibility, possibilities. Three basic texts about the, um, the text can perhaps lead us to ask some questions about its composition. Firstly, it is a rewriting of the Kavya Prakash. I've said this several times before, but it needs to be stressed. It's not a commentary. Um, so the Kavya Prakasha since its inception, gathered lots of different ways of explaining it. It became so important. So you have early commentaries like Manikya Chandra, which, is, which has the Karikas, the, the Vritti, and then a commentary. Or you have something like Govinda Thakura, which takes the Karikas but writes its own Vritti. This, however, rewrites it entirely, Karika, Vritti, and all. <coughs> and, uh, and it really... And the other interesting thing is it really localizes itself in Tanjore and in the reign of Raghunatha Nayaka. So it has, has this sort of uh, agenda. And thirdly, though, even though it's localized, it, has, it imagines itself a wider audience, especially in its polemic ideas. Like, you guys who read the Vritti Vartika of Apaya Dikshita or the Kuvalayananda, you are totally and completely wrong. Uh, we need to correct your wrong views. I mean, this is, this is the uh, interesting uh, subtext of it all. <clears throat> These three facts per perhaps provide three different <coughs> vantage points from which to examine the text, and each vantage point provides a slightly different sort of contextualization. Um, let's first look at how Raja Tudamani deals with the past. Uh, a striking feature of the Kavya Dharpana is his relationship with Mamata, as I've said before. Um, so, uh, so the important thing is uh, Mamata's... Um, kind of marrying of Dvani theory and linguistic theory with this kind of Alankarika uh, um, trope analysis. Um, but let's just see how he transforms it. Uh, so here's Mamata's introduction, which I think should be well known to, every, uh, to many people who've studied Sanskrit. Niyati krita niyamo rahitam hladaika maim ananya paratantram should be double T Adadati Bharati Kavir Jayati. Sorry. You can all correct you can all amend that mentally. <coughs> now compare this to Raja Chudamani's own uh, version. 
Nietjan, niet tam, hlada, main, never as ojvalam, kritim svatantram kurvana, kaver jayati bharati. Now you may ask yourself, why even bother? Um, it, uh, the basic construction is almost identical. Rajajiramani reuses uh, many of the keywords, almost all of the keywords. And I mean, one might argue, and one includes me, that the translation is vastly inferior. Uh, to the original, especially with this Hlada Maim right across the Yati, it just looks kind of not very nice to me, but maybe I could be wrong. So, so yeah, we have to ask ourselves why even bother? Firstly, uh, Raja Chudamani wanted to expand the scope of the Kavya Prakasha. The Kavya Dharpana includes m vastly more Kadakas than Mamata's Kavya Prakasha. So for instance, the Kavya Prakasha in the first two chapters contains 20 karakas. Uh, the Kavya Dharpana has 67. Raja Shudamani is able to expand on the ideas contained within the Kavya Prakasha and provide a new root text for a more fully realized exposition of Mamata's ideas. However, this explanation does not provide adequate coverage for the vast change in form between Raja Shudamani's Kavya Dharpana and Mamata's Kavya Prakasha. While Raja Chudamani gives no explicit justification for his project, a careful look at the genealogy of the form might provide a clue. Now, kind of interestingly, I would argue, I'm not drawing a direct connection yet. I think it's not a direct connection. It's a slightly more um, circuitous co connection. Uh, Raja Chudamani's construction of his root text um, seems to follow that of Dundon in the Kavya Darsha. Even then, I mean, we can even say the name hints towards this, but uh, the pull of the Kavya Darsha lurks even deeper. It is encoded in the structure. Uh, unlike Mamata's work, and like Dundon's, Raja Chudamani's Kavya Darpana is written in the 32 mil meter shloka, uh, 32 syllable shloka meter. And uh, I think even more interestingly, the Kavya Darpana includes examples within, includes examples within the Karaka section, a feature it shares with Dundon's text. For, um, for uh, comparison's sake, I just chose a random example from Dundon, uh, Apasnuti. I, I think we hadn't talked about Apasnuti, so I thought, okay, let's just do a different figure of speech. So we can see how it works. The first line, we have uh, the figure Apasnuti is the showing of some other thing after suppressing something else. And then he gives the example. Smarter does not have five arrows. Okay, we've, we've, uh, we've suppressed that. He has a thousand arrows. Okay, so this is our Apasnuti. Uh, example. <coughs> now to see how this might work in the context of this transformation between Mamata and Raja Chudamani, I have given the uh, um, example for um, or the fourth karika from uh, uh, the Kavya Prakasha. Um, so uh, that is Uttamam, idam Uttamam. Um, when the vyangya, the, the suggested meaning, is uh, superior to vacha, the, the directly denotated meaning. Um, that is called dvani by the wise. Okay. There's now we see how how does this work with an example? Then he gives his then in his uh, uh, vritti, he gives his uh, um, kind of explanation of this, and then we get our example of this sort of poetry. So this is that very uh, uh, famous verse, Nishesha Chutta Chandanam Stanatatam, the verse where um, she's talking to the messenger and says, oh, what are you, what are you saying, you know? Um, you obviously want to bathe, not to meet my lover, because, you know, the sandalwood paste has gone from your breast, and your eyes are without uh, their... Anjana, how do we translate Anjana? Ma mascara? <laughs> so I don't know how to say it. Uh, your body, you know, your hair is horripilated. Her so the idea is, the Vyanja meaning is, of course, oh, I sent you out to talk to my lover, but you made love with him instead. So, but that meaning is obviously superior to the Vacha meaning, which is you went to take a bath, because that, that's not a great... So this is the common example for this sort of poetry. Now let's see what Raja Shudamani does with the same thing. So, so first of all, he says, Uttamam madimam tadvad adhamam cheti tat krida. And he says, Vacha ati shai vyangyam yatrotamam tadvanis chasaha. Viksha Ramam Ganashyamam Sita Jata Naman Mukhi. So, 
the poetry in which the suggested sense surpasses the primary sense is the highest, and that is suggested poetry. So after seeing, after seeing Rama, dark as a cloud, Sita bent her face. Okay? So the important thing is how he encodes the example within the karika itself. He folds it in. <coughs> <coughs> Um, and by the way, you know, I was also just thinking of that Limpativa uh, Tamo Anjana. That's another example where that's folded directly into the uh, it was folded directly into the definition of of, of uh, uh, Upreksha or, or the discussion of Upreksha. Even though it's a quote, it's put right there in the same level as the as the discussion. If that makes sense. Okay. <coughs> So now this is an interesting example. I, I think this is interesting here because this provides the backbone for um, Raja Shudamani's interesting translation, transformation, what it, repurposing of Mamata, whatever you want to call it. Because some things that aren't explicitly in the Karakas of Mamata, um, and definitely not in Dundon, receive the same sort of treatment. So this kind of lakshana is considered to be gauni when it consists of a relation of a resemblance to a primary meaning. So that, this is, his, um, this is in, the second, uh, in the second chapter where he's giving definitions of different type of lakshana. And in each case, he supplies an example. A treasure of charm, this very one, is an expert in deceiving young men. Okay, so he, this is the same sort of way of writing. <coughs> Looking at this verse without getting into the intricacies of philosophy, um, it states very concisely the way in which a specific type of lakshana, in this case, niruda lakshana, I think. Yeah, niruda lakshana uh, is, is, uh, is supposed to work. He follows this up with an example in which contains the word lavanya, which means something some, somewhere between like, you know, grace or charm or beauty. What did I say? Charm. Um, and pravina, which means something like expert. But the point is that lavanya originally means salty, and pravina actually means like prakrishta vina, like he has a nice vina, but it comes to mean expert. <coughs> so he, this is how he des describes this kind of, of, of lakshana. So this verse is not in Mamata's original text, nor is it in any place an example included within the karaka. Raja Chudamani uses the form and style of which is related to Dundon's Kavya Darsha, yet Dundon never deals with this concepts of Lakshana that occupy the first two chapters of the Kavya Darpana. However, in his, uh, uh, so, so I just wanted to show you how he writes. And by the way, then the, all of this has a large commentary. So this, um, this one verse, I think in my typed uh, edition in Roman, this has a commentary that goes on for about four pages. Uh, about how this, how this works. Uh, while those side-by-side -side comparisons of the language of all three texts need to be made, it seems clear that the reference to the Karaka, uh, Raja Chudami rewrites the thought of Mamata in a different style, one that can be aligned, I think, with Dundon. In doing so, he places his work not only in the tradition of Mamata, but also in the tradition of the great Southern writer, Dundon, whose influence in the formative tradition uh, is, is so very important, as we've been talking about. <coughs> so perhaps we can argue kind of as a, it, it might lead one to argue kind of baldly that this is a marrying of a southern tradition and a northern tradition and this kind of new articulation or something like that. However, I think, um, I think this answer is both kind of too vague and too neat to put these uh, two things together. Um, and I think to both clarify and complicate our, our ideas, we have to introduce another figure. And that figure is the, who was looming large at the end of, of Whitney's piece, and who I'll turn to now. That figure is Apaya Dikshita. Um, so we, we've talked a, a, a lot about this great polymath. Um, and it's easy to, I mean, I would go so far as to say Rajat Shuramani is obsessed in a kind of strange way with Apaya Dikshita. It is all about Apaya Dikshita. So, Basically, the second chapter of Mamata beca becomes an almost point-by-point -point refutation of the Vritti Vartika. 
point by point. It just goes through in, in, in such a way. And it's kind of funny because I, I don't know if anyone else has heard this. I don't know if you've heard this. But when I was asking Anjanea Sharma about this, he says, oh, yeah, it's because the, uh, he was his brother-in-law um, that, that they, they hated each other so much. It was based on this kind of traditionally agonistic relationship. And, and I, I don't think that's true. I think they are related, but slightly differently. Uh, but the tradition themselves, or at least the popular imagination of the tradition, impli uh, gives them this kind of interesting relationship. Um, so, <coughs> and then the point becomes, uh, so, so just to give you a little bit of a background, and sorry, this might be too in-depth for, for those not really interested in Alankara Shastra, um, the whole thing comes down basically in Rajat Chudami's understanding is that Alankara Shastra cannot work unless you get Shabda Shakti Muladvani right. And unless you can differentiate Slesha from Shabda Shakti Muladvani in the correct way. And this becomes, I mean, this is a huge problem in, in, in Alankara Shastra in general, but this becomes the real essential problem in the second chapter of, of um, uh, the, uh, uh, the Kavya Dharupana. I mean, this is a very technical discussion. If, if you want to talk about it, ask me. I can talk about it for hours. Um, so, so here I want to suggest, though, without going into the philosophy, of the polemic in the terms of the philosophy, that Raja Chudami's overt polemic against Apaya Dikshita is undergirded by more subtle uh, argument and form. Apaya, in his own Alankara text, writes in a form very similar to Raja Chudamani, that is in shloka-based root text, including examples followed by an auto-commentary. So, um, so here's, here's Apaya and Apachnuti. We can see that this looks very familiar, like a pure Apachnuti is the kind of uh, disregarding of, of, of something for the sake of imposing something else. Yeah, Kuvalayananda, sorry, yeah. And uh, you know, then it says, that's not the moon, rather that is the, uh, the, uh, the, the lotus and the celestial Ganges. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Should write down translations underneath them. Um, so I think what's interesting here is that we have an interesting sort of form that's being used as a vehicle for writing Alankara Shastra that I think harkens back to older traditions, especially South Indian traditions of writing Alankara Shastra, but yet can become, yet gains importance through the work of Apaya Dikshita that becomes a, also a site of contention, that we can import the thought, the thought of Mamata, but to have it really work, we have to put it in this other form in an even better way, in a certain way, than Apaya Dikshita. So the battle not, become, not only becomes uh, intellectually about how, how Alankara Shastra works, but also how it's presented, who can do this uh, better in such a way. Uh, in that regard, I think um, what's interesting to think through here is, and, and I, I keep on going back to Charlie Hallisey's um, um, diagrams, the, the, the points of view from which you look at these texts. If you look at this from the point of view of Apaya Dikshita, he's copying Apaya Dikshita. When you look at it from the point of view of Raja Chudamni, he's trying to both appropriate his form and do it better the same way he's doing Mamata. If you look at it from Mamata, oh, he's just rewriting in a strange sort of way. So how can you s begin to triangulate or even quadrangulate um, between uh, these different sorts of intellectual poles? And I think that brings us to this larger question. Sorry, how much time do I have? Do I have any time left? Or? Oh, I, so I have plenty of time. I could just stand up here and talk. Um, <laughs> I think that brings us to a kind of uh, to um, the point that uh, we've been talking about is how can we how can we begin to see influence, how and how can we begin to conceptualize uh, influence, uh, especially with something like Dundon, which seems to move in ways that are both very overt in in translations, direct translations, as in the case of Tibetan modified translations, as, as in the case of the uh, uh, Kaviraja Marga, and also in, in more ephemeral ways, such as just different forms of writing, um, uh, Alankara Shastra. Um, so I actually think I'm going to just leave it here, because I'd like to have other people, uh, to hear what other people have to think about this um, idea of, of Dundon's form as uh, s supplying also an access to think about Dundon. So thank you. Uh, you 
said that uh, mm. um, the author gives uh, the highest importance to Shabda Shakti Mula Dhvani and Shlesha. This becomes the central point of the second chapter, which is a refutation of yeah. the Vritti Varpa. Uh, how, yeah. how does he differentiate the Shabda Shakti Mula Dhvani from Shlesha? I, is, has he given any new thought about that? Well, it's basically where the sl where the dvani is in that. In so, do you have do you have <laughs> so yeah. do you have two meanings? They are both by abhidha. They are both by direct denotation, and then the relationship between them is the dvani. Or do you have one meaning, a vyangya meaning, and then the relationship is a secondary vyangya? So he doesn't like Apaya's idea that there are two abhidha ideas with this with the dvani between them. He wants to say the second meaning that you get is actually a Vyangya meaning. So he, this is what, what he gets to. Uh, according to Appaya Dikshita, the second meaning is also gotten by Abhidha. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, how does uh, he say uh, that uh, the second meaning is gotten by Vyangya? Vyangya. What is the, what is the uh, stand he takes to prove that the second meaning cannot be Abhidha? <laughs> the, the, the question is that the second meanings are also approved by the dictionary. Mm -hmm. See, the dictionary gives mm -hmm. both meanings mm -hmm. in such cases. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is, it is correct to say that both meanings are Abhidha meanings. Yes. They have only. Yeah. Mamata takes the stand that on account of the fact that the Prakarana is controlling the situation, the mind of the reader goes only to the Prakaranika Artha. Mm -hmm. And the second meaning cannot come because <coughs> Abhidha is controlled, yeah. Abhidha niyantrana. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there uh, he argues that the second meaning should come only from Vyanjana. Yeah. That is uh, mm -hmm. a Mamata stand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Apart from that, has this author given any reason to believe that the second meaning has to come only from Vyanjana? Well, I mean, he gives quite, quite, a, quite a very long defense of, of, of Mamata's idea. Um, and I mean, this goes through, it's actually a very interesting portion because it basically goes through the entire history of Alankara Shastra, starting um, actually even with Dundon saying like, Dundon didn't talk about Dvani, but he got Slesha wrong, so we'll just leave him out. And then next we'll, we'll go on to um, different people, up to Ruyika, who he says is the worst. And then <laughs> Ruyika, because he's both clever and wrong, he, he, he'll lead you down the wrong track. And then, um, but he, I mean, he gives a lot of, he gives a lot of reasons, and, and he tries to follow this Mamata Siddhanta. So, I mean, he follows, I don't know if he brings any, anything new, he just really expands this sort of writing. His main thing is, if you have two Abhidhas, they have, you, can't, you can't know a meaning, two meanings simultaneously. There would have to be, you'd have to read the text yeah, twice, th and that's th a problem. <laughs> so what, the other one has to come through uh, Vyanjana. I mean, this is his basic, I think his simplest level argument. Then it gets more complex as he goes through. Oh, I'm so, gl so glad someone asked me about Salatia and Shabdi Shakti. Yeah, I am wondering if, yeah, um, we can, maybe you can just uh, confirm that I've either <laughs> interpreted this correctly <laughs> or incorrectly, oh. but um, th you're saying that Dundon's presence in the Kavya Darpana mm -hmm. is a formal presence. Yeah. But you're saying that the direct substantive engagement is with Apayadikshu. Yes. And yeah. with the Kuvalayananda, mm -hmm. which also shares this, many this of these formal features yeah, with yeah, Dundon. Yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking about how Dundon exists in the world or, mm -hmm. or in various worlds. I mean, we s we've seen many cases where um, when people are thinking about Dundon, they're actually thinking about Dundon through Bretna Shri mm -hmm. or they're thinking about Dundon through other people. Or maybe they're not thinking about Dundon at all, but <laughs> in the course of thinking about Bretna Shri they are thinking about Dundon. Mm -hmm. So what would you say the, the kind of specific engagement with, with Dundon is if you kind of, I don't want to say if you separated out mm -hmm. the Apaya Dikshita, mm -hmm. is there any Dundon left? Well, so. I guess there's different ways that we've been talking, uh, uh, different ways that we've been talking about how Dundon gets engaged. And what we tend to look for is direct, okay, he quotes Dundon, which Raju Shridami definitely quotes Dundon. He quotes Dundon. He's, usually Dundon is 
a nice example on the way to my. He doesn't. He's usually not very. He's very mean to Dundon in terms of Slesia, but uh, in terms of other things, usually it's a nice point of view on the way to the real Siddhanta, which is with Mamata and my interpretation of Mamata. So there is, I mean, there's that sort of engagement in a certain way. However, I wanted to try to think through something that I think has been brought up in a lot of talks is how can we, how can we think about other ways that influence or that uh, diffusion or something like that happens outside of direct quotation. And I don't, I'm sorry, I don't really have a, a, a a clear answer even in my mind now. I'm still working through this in my mind, so I'm, I'm definitely uh, looking for um, any sort of um, hints or, or ideas from you all. But I, what I think is interesting is that when Alankara Shastra is kind of starts to be rewritten in this period, its form also changes in a certain way. It doesn't use this Kashmiri form, it, even though it uses these Kashmiri ideas. Um, and I think Maybe we can say, oh, this is just something totally new, but the fact that it kind of looks like Dundon, does that have an ideological, in, in a certain sense, does this have an ideological baggage? I think that's a different question. I'm not sure. But I think that there is something going on here about claiming certain genealogies of writing, perhaps. And that could be uh, ideological. So. Thank you so much, and thanks also for bringing in Apaya Dikshita. I am very much sympathetic to Raja Chujamani Dikshita because I'm too obsessed with Apaya Dikshita. <laughs> and so I, 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 can, I can understand him very well, although I, I, I'm on the other side of this uh, family <laughs> divide. Um, so this, th I mean, this is a fascinating situation that Dundin continues to be a, a, a strong presence a thousand years later in Sanskrit literary theory, despite how far the theory itself went. I mean, that fact in and of itself comes very clear from, from Luther's uh, presentation, and, that's, and it's just fascinating. We need to find explanations of this. We need to find explanation for the fact that despite the fact that the Kashmiris turned away from him, they kept reading him. Despite the fact that the Kashmiri model was <coughs> operative in the Hoysala court that Whitney was talking about, the Dundin model was still in operation. And then some 400 years later, it was still very much at play. So what exactly was its role, I, I think we still need to figure out. But that it was there. And that although nobody speaks about it, but everybody knew that it was there in the vernacular, is all, uh, this, is, this is a fascinating phenomenon. Okay, so I, I just wanted to highlight this fact. But then I wanted to say on the formal aspect mm. of things, so this is an, an important missing piece in this puzzle, and that's the Chandraloka. Mm -hmm, yeah. Okay, so in addition to Mamata's Kavya Prakasha, and as a response to Mamata's Kavya Prakasha, there's another synthesis that's done by a guy named Jayadeva called the Chandraloka. That is already, it's a 13th century yeah. word, yeah, is already in this form of shloka verses, is already in this form, this kind of dandin form, as you called it, where you have the definitions and the examples in, uh, in, in a shloka anushtub meter. It's a very much model after Mamata. It's the same 10 chapters, the same grand synthesis of, of Kavya, uh, or, or theory about Kavya, let's put it this way. And what is very much at the back of Raja Turamadi Dikshita's mind is that Apaya Dikshita already did to it what he is doing to Mamata's <laughs> Kavya Prakasha. That is, he rewrote re -wrote the, the, not the whole text, yeah. But the Mayuka, that chapter on Alankaras, yeah. he took it apart and rewrote it with his own vritti and with his own examples, but he also rewrote the karikas of the text to a very, very significant extent, reusing the familiar elements, but rewrote it. So here we have two, s two Alankara, so, so, in this, in the, in, so in the 16th century, 17th century South India, we have these two models of, uh, of synthesis <coughs> of Alankara Shastra as it comes to be understood in the Navya world. One, Mamata, 
that is now rewritten <laughs> by 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 uh, by uh, Raja Chudamani, mm -hmm. and one the Chandra Loka, the Alankara section of Chandra Loka that does not try uh, doesn't try to do the whole thing. That's an important thing, just the Alankaras, mm -hmm. but it's rewritten in the same form, and both of them. Both Apaya Dikshita and Raja Chudamani, with these two competing, it's all in the family, right? <laughs> it's two competing family presentations from South India on how to understand Alankara Shastra. Both of them extensively quote Dundin, and both of them are influenced by Dundin, perhaps also in form. It's, it's a fascinating situation. It's just uh, here, here we have Whitney's two families now in the same family. <laughs> it's all in the same family. You know? yeah. No, that, I, I mean, that, that's a great point. Sorry, I, and this is something, you know, I was working on this, and then someone said to me, well, what, what about the Chandra Loka? And I was like, oh, and I hadn't even thought about that. But this also, you know, so maybe, you know, maybe I'm just reading too much into it. Maybe this is just the form that things take, but I do think this form bears some, something to think about in terms of Dundon. However, that's also not to say that other people don't use something similar. So, for instance, uh, um, uh, some of the verses in... Uh, 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 Bamaha, uh, sorry, I've just lost my mind for a second. Uh, Bamaha does something similar, so maybe this is an old style of, of writing, or even some things, you know, that they said, uh, um, um, Urbata wrote a kind of version of the, the Kumar Sambhava, right? That with, and that these, were, that these illustrate, uh, uh, sorry, go <laughs> But this is not. But Udbata is not like. Yeah, Udbata is What's not like this. What's interesting here is not that the he's that the they're all shlokas. Mm -hmm. What's interesting in Dundon and distinctive, and it's true of the Chandra Loka and the Kulana and this, and it's not true of, except for Bama, of <laughs> any of the Kashmiri works, is that you have fragment verse fragments for Udahar. It's after yeah. definitions. Yeah, yeah. So like Limpati and Tamongani is a whole verse that's plugged into Dundon, mm -hmm. but it's where you have things like. Even this, at least, it's a half verse, but yeah. sometimes you have a fragment of a line. So the example is that it could never have been a real verse. It couldn't exist yeah. outside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas, half a verse. Well, so no, but he quotes the whole thing later. <coughs> he quotes it, yes. In the prayer, he gives the whole verse. Uh, what he's in Upama when he's saying why it's not an Upama. He quotes just the first line. Later, he quotes the whole verse. Yes, uh, he does. He does. He does. <laughs> just, I'll find it for you. I just looked recently. He does. Um, <laughs> No, he discusses. That's where the no, comes in. is he mentions it in two different places? Oh. I'll I'll show you later. Show you later. But, um, but so in the Kashmir work, in the works that aren't like this, even when you're making up your own examples, like Udbata is in the Kavyalankara Sangra Sangra on these like Yashobushna texts and all that, mm -hmm. the Udahanas are created as if they were separate examples of practice. So mm -hmm. there's kind of meshing, this blurring of yeah. Lakshana and Lakshya, mm -hmm. right? Which is distinctive of this kind of less determinate, less closed down, sort of more sort of open-ended mm -hmm. um, thing. And I think that may be something that's really distinctive and does seem to be distinctively southern, except for the few preliminary things in Bama, yeah, which are yeah. pretty rare in Bama, yeah, not yeah, super common. Yeah, yeah. I, I, th that's kind of where I'm going. <laughs> I think you're right, but I think that's the key feature. Mm. Not that they're all in the same first level. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that. Um, let me go to chat. <coughs> <coughs> Just a question that's building on the comment that you all just made. Uh, and it's when you think about this pattern of the rewriting of the karikas, and then you go to the local language versions, which are rewriting the karikas all the time. So what reason do we have to say that they're different in kind rather than just different in degree? And uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, what you say, oh, this is a strange practice, it may be that it's not seen as strange, uh, and our sense of language difference may make us see a difference in kind that might not be in the practice itself. And this is why I, I think I, I, I keep on coming back to the idea of translation, because part of me wants to see this, uh, this blurring between translation and commentary, I think, in my mind as, as theoretical constructs, because we, we bring the, we bring Commentary and translation as two separate things that people can do to text. You have a text, you can translate it. You have a text, you can comment on it. Whereas I think, I think uh, there might be something more complicated going on in these rewritings, in these translations. And 
could we call this a translation? I think so. Why do, why do we have to translate things into different languages? I think we can translate things into the same language. And why, do, why can't we not call a translation a commentary? I think that's, uh, I think th these become really interesting categories that we have to think through ourselves and then can help us think through these, these relationships. And I think this is the kind of an interesting way to think through and around this kind of diffusionist sort of model that people, uh, that we've been coming back to a bit. <coughs> Um, thanks, Luther. I th it's very helpful to think in terms of form. I have a clarificatory question, which is that you, um, several, you and, and Larry gestured towards some kind of a South Indian Sanskrit style here in, the, in this form of embedding yeah. the lakshya in the, in the lakshana. So, so, so just to clarify, the Chandraloka is also Southern, is southern Sanskrit? Is this? No. Okay. No. no. Okay. Arisa. Yeah. So Arisa, bit, Arisa. Okay. Okay. So other than <coughs> Abaya and and Dundin, is this a style that we see in other southern uh, Sanskrit Alankara Shastra? Is that? Um. What would you say, Larry? <laughs> I, I want to defer I mean, to you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Chandra, again, a little bit of Yeah. This. Yeah, there so may be others, but the, of the famous ones, I yeah. think. Okay. Just a comment that, it, that given the argument that you're putting forth about, or the suggestion that you're putting forth about form, I, I think it's interesting that, that um, neither the, so, so that the, that the Dundon adaptations in Tamil do not pick up on this form, mm. um, and the, the, although we haven't seen the, the full range of the, of the Tamil adaptations of the Kvilayan in them, of which it seemed to be a sort of veritable explosion in the, um, in the 18th and 19th centuries, mm. um, that we see a range of form, including the embedding of the lecture in the lectina, but also a kind of removal of the examples um, from, the, from, mm. the, um, from the grammar. Mm. Yeah. I, uh, uh, yeah, this is what I'm trying to think through from the, that's why I kind of wanted to do this from the point of view of form, just to maybe make that another angle to approach things like this. So, yeah, that's useful. Um, uh, I mean, and clearly, as the discussion's indicating, you're, you're onto something about this, uh, this integral, um, you know, extended shloka form. And I'm also very, I'm very sympathetic, I mean, as you know, because we, we've talked about this for years, I'm very sympathetic with about this idea about Sanskrit's well, this particular, if not unique, quality for intralinguistic translation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I, I, no, no other language I know has the ability to do that as, as, as readily and as <coughs> and the users of the language haven't taken part in it as much. The other question, and this is one that I've uh, that I'm also you know intermittently very interested in over the years, is auto commentary. Mm -hmm. um, now, and, and I, I, I argued at one point that auto commentary kind of comes up in Kashmiri and Alankara Shastra, and it's a real, it's this kind of transformational moment. Um, I've maybe thought a little bit more about that, and Larry's per directed me towards things that I that, that, that I was missing out on before. <coughs> but yeah, I was particularly interested in the question about. With both Apaya and Raja Chodamani Dikshita, that um, to what extent, s first of all, if, if you have any sense, particularly because we're getting to these very relatively recent authors, mm -hmm. do you have any sense of the production history of their texts, whereas whether they produced their mula first and the mula was mm -hmm. actually in circulation, mm -hmm. or whether the text actually exists, in particularly in Raja Chodamani's case, do they really exist as a pretext for this? Really, really linguistically, theoretically intensive Navyanayaka style of analysis that occurs in the commentary. Mm. Well, um, that's a question that I think needs to be addressed, and I, I, I don't. I, I wish I had an easy answer for that, which I which I don't. However, um, I think in one level, Alankara Shastra in Sanskrit is really interesting because it's a discipline in search of a sutra. Um, and that different texts can provide a basis in different ways. But there is no fixed text that you go back to. Like, everybody has to go back to Dundon. That's not the case. It seems that Mamata kind of fulfilled this role, but in a weird sort of way, that you could still rewrite Mamata or take part of Mamata and leave another part, you know, that sort of thing. So I think that's one issue that is interesting in Alankara Shastra specifically. As far as the writing of these sorts of works, yeah, I, I don't really know. I'm wondering if it's like, oh, you, you write your nice, easy, light things, and then you, know, you have this huge commentary underneath it. Part of me would say, oh, well, maybe this is, that's how it's supposed to be. You present 
the nice the nice kind of definitions to the king. Lots of times they talk about the king, and then you write your own uh, your own issues uh, that you're really interested in underneath it. That doesn't quite work though because um, Actually, uh, many of the long praise poems of Raghunath Nayaka. So, for instance, in chapter two, the the, the, in, in te, uh, the extended ad hominem attack on uh, Upaya Dikshita, there are 15 praise poems of Raghunath Nayaka just embedded in these long Navya Nayaka discussions of, of Slesha. So uh, it's kind of yeah. I, I don't really I don't really know because I mean this is purely speculative. But I've, I mean and, I, and Larry Yigal Nagarjur also. I mean I'd be interested to know what all of you think about this. I, I, I had a feeling, and I, I wrote about this at one point, about the idea that the, particularly the Dhanya Loka, some of the question, the ongoing question about attribution of the verse and the prose, mm -hmm. had to do not with, <coughs> the, with the fact of multiple authors, but of a kind of time gap. Mm -hmm. um, that the, 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 the sutra, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Mula text went into circulation, became the object for, for, for debate and discussion, and then subsequently we have in some sense a kind of transcription authorial transcription of an elaborate apologia and defense of his own text. Mm. Well, um, now, I mean, in this case, but I wonder if this case, this is much more, you know, he's, he's throwing these out in order to yeah, produce. I think, no, I think he's throwing these out in order to produce, and the reason why is because the new karakas that he introduces, especially in the second chapter, are introduced in order to follow up by his argument. And then that the refutation is, is given below. You wouldn't get that he's following up by his argument from the karakas themselves necessarily. Um, so I think, I think you can say these were written together. I don't think there's a time gap, in, at least in this case. Yeah, I believe that that's true of Anand of Arnhem, but I think it's very unusual. I think it's very crystal clear that this was written as a package, yeah. and it would make no sense. <laughs> Nobody would bother or want to read these karakas by themselves. Yeah. I'm interested in those praise poems of Raghujan Naika. You said they're in the... Verthi, are they in the Virthi? Yeah, yeah, these longer ones are in the Virthi. So they're not they're, shlokas, they're other meters. Yeah, the ones that are other meters the are in the Virthi. So you have these sort of embedded in the Karika yeah. examples, which are simpler and shorter because yeah. they're in a shloka meter. And then when he wants to, he creates, again, quasi-independent yeah, Udaharna verses. I, said, I put one up here in the Shardula Vitridita okay. thing. This is what, <laughs> what yeah. Raghunatha can teach us about Lakshana, because he has this Mukta Tula Koti. Uh, and just rare word. He uses rare Which words. Which again is sort of, it's Kuvalayana to ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, it's the style of the Kuvalayana. Cool yeah. <coughs> well, it's, it's just a reading suggestion. It may have been uh, included in Jennifer's sentence, but I'm not sure if that's what she meant. Are you aware that? Uh, there is a Tamil translation of uh, Kuvalayanandam. Of course, we live in a universe where things have to be translated to English mm -hmm. because this is a universal language. But the, that text uh, was in, uh, produced in a universe where people mm. wanted to be able to read it in Tamil. Mm. I've not read it. I have it as part of a big book containing 41 uh, grammatical treatises. Mm -hmm. And listening to you makes me think I should try to read <laughs> it. But maybe you also would be interested. I, I will yeah. hopefully learn Tamil sometime very soon to uh, to try to read it. But I, when when was it translated? Do you know? Is it fairly early or do you know? Anything? I don't know who translated the Tamil, the Tamil translation. Like mm. um, I, I'd rather Jennifer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There, there, it's confusing exactly what texts we're dealing with, but we've identified at least six, and we have three of them, um, and there, there may even be more. So, um, yeah. So we've just, <laughs> we just, <laughs> we just started this. A lot of do, you know, do you have any idea about the dates, or? We don't. I mean, we know we know that one of them is 19th century. One of them seems to be an early 19th century copy of an earlier text but um but and, and it looks as though editors too have there's been a there's um been a combining of some pr or a uh, adaptation of prose version uh prose versions prose adaptations into into sutra into verse so it's a, it's a complicated picture we're still yeah. we're still working it and out and this seems to be even now in sanskrit if you learn sanskrit at a university or something this is the textbook that you use right i mean you don't use mamata you use the in in tamil it, oh no sorry? in sanskrit ah uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
comment and also a question. Uh, one thing is I'm super interested in uh, this question of genre, uh, sutra, mula text, uh, commentary, uh, sub-commentary, right? Mm -hmm. So when an author chooses to write uh, in, in verse uh, a new shastra mm -hmm. uh, or someone else who is writing in commentary, what kind of effect, I guess, uh, um, but by virtue of writing in that form, uh, perhaps uh, a, sh a new shasta writing uh, written in verse has <coughs> a certain kind of, uh, of effect uh, in terms of its re reception in the future. And mm. uh, also, uh, Whitney uh, brought up the question of uh, auto commentary versus commentary. You know, what what different uh, effect it would have? Uh, what does it mean to uh, for someone to write an auto commentary? So, so those type mm -hmm. of questions uh, in terms of, of by choosing a certain genre of writing, what kind of uh, effect would it have? Mm -hmm. um, so that that's something that, that I, you know, if you like to comment on that. Uh, and the other thing I, uh, is to continue on uh, what Andrew has said uh, about uh, citation of citation. So mm -hmm. something which, or one thing is citation, or the other is the use, mm -hmm. the reuse of something which has already been used. Mm -hmm. So there is something about this intertextuality mm -hmm. uh, that when you, uh, use something which you know that has been used before. Uh, it's like there's uh, an additional uh, richness, uh, thickness, mm -hmm. whatever you call it. I almost think of it as uh, an, an uncanonized uh, figure. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. something about that. So, um, in, in ways of uh, trying to think about, you know, what what are the different <coughs> ways we can uh, categorize those mm -hmm. and, and think about those. Yeah, those are really good points and questions. And again, this is something I'm just starting to think about myself or that this text has made me um, uh, 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 think about. The so I at one level, you might ask yourself, why, why would such a text be produced? I mean, it, it seems to have so many pulls in a certain way. To rewrite Mamata, to pr provide a Siddhanta of Mamata. Okay, that's fine. To ch tell everyone for certain that Apai is wrong. Okay. To praise Raghunath and Nayaka. Okay, it just seems strange that these, that these different vectors come together in one text that you might not expect it. I mean, there seems to be perhaps at this time period, every king wants to have an Alankara Shastra with him kind of put into it. I mean, this happens in vernaculars, this happens in Sanskrit. Um, so, I mean, that might be some way to think about it. And also, I mean, this kind of Navya moment, I mean, this could also be part of a more intellectual historical moment rather than just uh, something about patronage. Uh, yeah, and then also the idea of richness. It's kind of interesting because it's not clear to me if he expects us to, to you know, for instance, like this verse, if you knew, if you knew Mamata, I mean, I think I would find that verse terrible. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe I maybe I'm just judging it too harshly. Um, I don't find it that beautiful of a transformation of Mamata, but it's very recognizable yeah, as Mamata. Yeah, yeah. Nobody would possibly not know that verse. Yeah, but then again, then why not play with it more? Why use all of the same words in a worse way? You know, I don't know. I, uh, these. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, he's he's not the he's not the greatest poet, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 hard, and especially I mean, when you want to talk about richness, uh, sometimes you know it's funny because you find, you find, <laughs> I, I you find uh, uh, Raja Shyamani much worse in his expression than you find the original. So there's also kind of a reverse <laughs> richness or something. I don't know. Or it makes you, yeah, I don't, I, it's really hard to begin to talk about this. And I, yeah, I'm still struggling with that myself, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry to, to, to take so much air space here, but I want to come back to, to your, to highlight your main point about form. There's something about the form of Dandin that I think uh, that I think I, ca I can make a strong argument for Bama's inventing this form mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, self-written uh, lakshanas embedded into uh, the anushtubs that come with the definitions, but Dandin making it work so much better and so much more efficiently. This becoming a form that 
in and of itself is one of the one of the secrets of of Dundin's uh, Dundin's success. <coughs> or if we're if we keep in mind this qu why Dundin question, mm -hmm. there was this this was this very very effective, beautiful, written by a great poet actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but very elegant and effective form to the Kavya Darsha. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Well. <laughs> in, in the world of Sanskrit Alankara Shastra, it's a very unsuccessful form. As they, it's very rarely imitated. Right. I know. But it's, it's think of all the works that knowingly, since they know Dundon, don't copy that form. Mm -hmm. It's not as if it took over. I didn't, or I didn't say it was successful. Okay. Mm -hmm. I said it was effective. Okay. Nice <laughs> well, that's a, that's a much longer this. debate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if there, there are no questions, uh, uh, why don't we thank uh, Luther for this uh, wonderful talk.